This is the third year that I have wanted to do a series called Will There Be a Civil War? So it's a, a sermon series that happens once annually, which is kind of unusual. And I don't know if it's helpful or not, but I find it helpful as we celebrate July 4th to spend some time thinking about our faith in the light of our history. The first sermon that I gave on this talked about the different ways in which the church failed during the Civil War. The ways in which the church of the 1700s, 1800s embraced different ideas that enabled them to come to completely different conclusions about enslaving people. And not only conclusions about enslavement, but also about the nature of God's purposes for people, the nature of who God is, and how we read the Bible. So that because of those different ways of understanding uh, what it meant to be a Christian in America, we ended up with a church that was completely ineffective with solving the battle about what to do about enslaved people. And the only battle that solved it was a battle in blood so that so many, many people died. I want to think with you today about not the external battle so much as the internal battle that we face, the Civil War as a model for us as the civil wars within ourselves, the ways in which our inner lives can be at cross purposes as we try to follow Jesus. If you have been breathing for the last seven days, you know this is a reality, that the different ways in which we engage the world bring us into conflict between our own desires, our own inner sense of things, and our principles, those values that we hold because we are believers. The story that the gospel gives us kind of highlights that, right? There are two different ways of viewing the same thing. Jesus is walking with his disciples. His disciples have pulled some weed or grabbed some food and eaten it without washing their hands. So the people around him, particularly the religious authorities, are not, they're looking at that with a particular narrative, a narrative of a tradition where you do not do that. If you love God, if you obey God, you do not eat without washing your hands. And so they raise that question with Jesus. And so it's the tradition, it's the way of thinking that they bring. And Jesus counter-argues that's hypocrisy, the heart of the matter is that who God is and who God calls us to be is more about grace and love and not about just holding the rules. In fact, when we just hold the rules, we get it wrong 99% of the time. So we can relate to this. Back during the time before the Civil War, there was a woman named Sarah Moore Grimke. She was a very affluent young lady because her parents were super affluent. They were slaveholders. Her dad was the chief justice of the Supreme Court of North Carolina. They had lots of money and lots of power. And Sarah grew up in that. She was able to learn all sorts of things because of her dad letting her read his books in his library. She was an avid learner, but she was profoundly shy. In the midst of her life, she went to the Episcopal Church every Sunday. She listened and sat beneath the pulpit, similar to this, and heard pastors talking about Jesus, about following the Bible. She lived in a world with a profound duplicity because her mother and her family would come and they would sit at the front of the pews. They would pay a lot of money for pew rent so that they could be seen all the way down the aisle while everybody else was going by, they saw these affluent people sitting in church. But Monday through Saturday, she saw the same pious people who attended church, her mother, her father, permitting and even perpetrating profound abuse on other people because they perceived them as inhuman, as slaves, as chattel objects that they owned. 
And this young woman lived with this inner battle. How do I make sense of a world in which I see a call to love of Jesus, and yet all around me there's a contradiction, even among people who are Christians? How do I resolve that? It's a similar challenge for us, right? Because we live in a world where we see that there are contradictions. And part of that contradiction is because people make God what they will. Because providence at that time was an understanding that God permitted slavery, that God permitted the people to come into the United States, colonize it, Christianize it, and whatever the consequences of that were, they were legitimated because there was a sense of divine providence and call to do it. Sarah felt dissonance with that. She felt a dissonance in her heart because she had a sense that Jesus was calling the people to something different. And that, in fact, if the people could listen and think about it, they would agree and they would change. And so eventually, Sarah left South, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, right? I get the Carolinas. Yeah, okay. She was from Charleston. So she left Charleston. She goes to Pennsylvania and becomes a Quaker. This shy woman starts writing to the churches of the South and writing to them scripture after scripture after scripture. Think about this. Think about why enslaving people is wrong. Pretty soon she's standing up in front of people talking about that. Her convictions changed her. Her. The inner battle between what was wrong with what she was seeing and what she was called to by her own sense of who Jesus is, who the Gospels call us to be, changed her. And so she starts writing books. This shy woman, for years and years, she died in her 80s, committed her life to speaking out against slavery. She was in her 70s when the Civil War began, and all through that awful period, she did what she could to call for the, in the end to support abolition and also to call for women to have the right to vote. We're not all going to be like Sarah Grimke, but we're all people who have that inner call to an ethic that is more than just making sure we follow the rules, that's more than just saying that we put out a sort of visible, this is who I am because I'm a Christian. We are invited to a transformation inside where we let that inner struggle for identity help us learn what our core values are and live out of them. Do you know what your core values are? Do you know what are the things that cause you to act purposefully, that cause the response? Or do you know when you're not following them? Are you aware of what you want to be versus who you're not? The invitation for us, regardless of how old we are or how young we are, is to learn what those are. What are those values that we have in Christ that are modeled most perfectly and truly there, and are we putting them on? Are we letting them be so much a part of us that they speak to others? Brene Brown says that we have two core values. Others argue we have up to five to 10. For those of us who aren't so good at math, I'm going with two because I'm, you know, I got it, I get that. And I think it's really important to know what they are so that we can be sure we're living in them and honoring them. What are yours? Have you named them? Are they in line with the Gospels? I know sometimes my core value is not in line. Sometimes those things that I feel like are so urgent really aren't my core, but I'm acting out of them. Is it a compulsive need to control? What is the core value behind that? What is the fear? And who are you really? Who do you really want to be? Is it a compulsive desire for justice? How does that align with who Jesus is? And therefore, how will we act through it? These are our questions. 
As you think this week about your values, I invite you to maybe think about a time in your life where you are acting in your values and then a time when you wish you had and you didn't. And put those up together and think about how you could do it in the future so that it was more of a reflection of what you're committed to when there was not a success. The good news, my friends, is that Jesus calls us to peace, calls us to an interpeace, an inner peace that allows us to move past those battles within. And the way that we do it is the forgiveness of Jesus, that we are loved regardless of how well we know our core values or how well we do on any given day. Love and forgiveness of Jesus. And then, the hope and promise that we will have peace that passes understanding as we move deeper in and higher up with our Savior. So standing on those, may we remember the peace that passes all understanding and follow. Sarah Grimke looked back on her life and she said, what I see was a difficult, disappointing path. She never married, she never had children, she lived in a choice of poverty, having been born into affluence. But we say her name, and we know that the impact she had on our country during a time of profound disruption was transformative. And that is our hope too, that what we give our little light in the world is a part of the transformation and goodness that will someday be fulfilled in the loving promise of God and the kingdom come. Amen.